Here we are for the second part of the longest episode today on this podcast. This is Talk Ag to Me. Hello and welcome to Talk Ag to Me, the podcast dedicated to improving ag literacy around the globe. I'm your host, Brandon Black, and in today's episode, we cover the second half of our conversation with Thomas Durr about the significance of agriculture throughout history. This is a really great conversation. I was hoping to get this episode out sooner, but things got busy with student teaching and I got a little bit sidetracked, but we are here now. The second part is out. You are able to finish the uh, to date longest episode of Talk Agnomy. I'm sure we might top it someday, but for right now, this is the longest one we've recorded and it's a really, really solid episode. We covered some really interesting topics in the first part. In the second part, we cover a lot more interesting topics in terms of the implications of agriculture, uh, agricultural education and con- uh, the conjunction of agriculture and, and history in education. Um, as well as just the, you know, more diving into the significance of agriculture throughout history, fun stuff that we talk about a lot. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoy the episode. Go ahead and show Thomas all the attention and love he deserves. I'll put all his links down in the, down in the description, just like I did for the first part. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, do all the things. Make sure you share it with not just your online friends and family, but with your offline friends and family as well. And if you'd like to donate and help out the podcast, the Patreon is down in the link in the description below. Um, but that's all I have for you guys this episode. I hope to catch you all in the next one. Uh, I have some really exciting guests coming down the pipeline, so I can't wait to show all you guys all of our great episodes coming out. But uh, that's all I have for you. So let's get into the episode. Dude, like <laughs> <laughs> Agriculture has been the start and end of several wars and several conquests. And I mean, like it was, you know, one of the causes of the fall of the Roman Empire, it was one of the causes of the fall of the South during the Civil War. It was the cause of the French Revolution, or not the cause, but it was... Yeah, you cut people of off of resources, Germany surrendered too. Yeah, uh, exactly. The, blockade, you know, the, the oceanic blo- blockades and everything, they couldn't get any food. <laughs> yeah, so that was like, like, yeah, ag is, is one of the... I, I argue that agriculture has been the most prevalent aspect of history and the most consistent aspect of history because the first civilization was founded because we learned how to farm and so you know it's like (laughs) and so it's like i that's one of the things and that's in my opinion one of the most important reasons why agricultural literacy should be more prioritized is because with agriculture being such a relevant part of history and such a relevant part of society besides the fact that like yeah we all have to eat like duh but also it's just so interwoven with everything that we do and everything that we see and everything that we experience. Why would you not want to know what's going on with it? You know, and like, you don't have to know everything, but to be aware of what's going on in the industry is very important. If you want to be a, you know, an active citizen. I, I agree. That's literally, so um, I didn't, I didn't say it before. Cause I don't, I'm not really like working on it now, but I do have a podcast. I started working on like a couple of years ago, like when COVID started, it's called get informed. And like, my thing was like, I'm just so tired of people like, having infinite techno infinite like access to information at the palm of their hands and at their fingertips and they're not even informed on like the most basic things like one thing that irks me so much is like my kids don't even understand their rights like i have them try to you know learn the the, the um the bill of rights and like they gotta know what they're they gotta know what those are you're given those you know yeah. like those are yours keep yeah. them know them <laughs> and it's sad because the kids don't know they don't care um, I, my, my co-teacher would make fun of me all the time because I slammed the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments into the kid's head and we're doing like civil war and reconstruction. I would, it was like an extra credit question for like weeks and kids were just not getting it. I'm like, bro, I'm like, this is like literally like equal opportunity yeah. and like, <laughs> like black men can vote. Like, this is like, this is, these are massive accomplishments. Like you need to know this, <laughs> right? but like, they, people are not informed on this stuff. And yeah. I mean, Honestly, can you blame them and like not being informed on agriculture? Like people are so worried about what the newest TikTok trend is. They're not, I don't care where their food comes from. They just know that it's there and they take it for granted. That's another thing. I think with technology, um, people are very spoiled. Like, um, I, like when I was in college, I was actually a very big liberal guy. I was like, very like, yeah, communism is pretty cool. And then now as an adult, I'm like, you know, I see where communism comes from, but it's pretty dog shit. So I, I've kind of like, I've, I've like, I've accepted. I'm like, look, honestly, like I would listen, I'd be cool with a communist society, but the problem is every human's flawed. Everyone sucks. And someone's yeah. gonna, someone's gonna want to screw someone over at some yeah. point or get greedy or prideful and their Talk ego's going to take over. Food. Yeah, exactly. And then, <laughs> yeah, it's like, all right, well, I'm the farmer today, so you're not getting food. It's like, yeah. you're going to starve, idiot. So it's like, oh, chill. <laughs> um, so I, I think that people do need to be a little bit informed. And that's why I actually, I like your podcast a lot. It's very, it's unique. 
but it's also extremely informative. You're very um, well versed on your field, which is really awesome. I don't really get to come across many people that are um, like as academically suited to their subject. Usually it's just random people that just do podcasts. Yeah. And um, it definitely provides like an important, like I would love to show this to like my kids and like, and I think anyone should just listen to this because it gives like a general synopsis to kind of like a little bit of history of agriculture, the importance of agriculture, the effects of agriculture, how we use agriculture, how how farmers function, why they function, how we can help them, how we can help the environment, how we can be better consumers of food and just like this whole like symbiotic relationship that we have with like nature and animals and, and like human existence, right? So I think it's, listen, dude, I think it's some cool, I think it's cool stuff. There it is. That's my new podcast trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> no, I, pre- I appreciate you saying that. But no, I, I, I do try really hard to make sure I'm informed on all of that stuff because if I'm going to be preaching that people need to be educated about agriculture, then I should probably also be educated about agriculture. So I and I I you know make an effort to make sure that I am aware of when I get things wrong and I call out when I get things wrong because I'm you know, I believe in transparency and I believe that we have a lot of people who think they know things when they really don't. And so if I get something wrong, I want to say, hey, sorry, I messed up. It's actually this, you know? And so I anyway. yeah, I I very I I appreciate transparency from people who, you know, if if they know something then they should have the humility to admit that they don't know everything. You know, and I I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, listen, if I say something wrong or I make a mistake, just call me out on it, I'll fix it. Or if they ask me a question, I'm not gonna be the guy that pretends like, yeah, you know, George Washington, you know, I'm like a F6 thumb, you know. (laughs) I'm like, "Uh, you know, George, let me look that up and I'll get back to you tomorrow and I'll let you know about his the sixth thumb that George Washington might have had. Yeah, no, exactly. And so, uh, yeah, I, I try really hard to make sure that that is a big element of my podcast is, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert. I've done a lot of research. I continue to do a lot of research every day to make sure I'm on top of my stuff. Like a lot of the stuff we talked about today is going to be in my lesson for my kids tomorrow, uh, because this is stuff that I think is you know important to talk about. As we talked about, this is, you know, we're in what I believe to be, you know, the middle of potentially two agricultural revolutions. Things are changing so fast. You kind of need to know what's going on. And like, like you said, I don't expect anybody to be fully literate in agriculture or fully knowledgeable about what's going on in the industry because there's just so much. And agriculture is not the only thing that's going on in the world. And there's so many distractions and people choose to get distracted by a lot of things because they don't want to deal with the real world. And I don't blame them because the real world kind of sucks. But I try to make sure that my material and my content is oriented in a way that it's both interesting, but that people can talk about it without it giving them a whole bunch of, you know, doom and gloom about the world, you know, try to show them that like, hey, there's still some cool stuff going on out there. And a lot of it has to do with your food. And maybe that'll give you some hope that, you know, maybe even though the world sucks, the farmers suck slightly less, maybe. But yeah, maybe maybe we could do we could add a little bit of like spunk or, or fun to what's going on. And yeah, no, I, mean, I understand like, I understand, you know, for the next eight years you're gonna be voting for people you don't like, but you know, uh yeah. you know, maybe care about your food. Thank exactly. you, farmer. Yeah, and that's why I try to do like, you know, I I do uh I do. I did a mini, mini series on here for a while, and I still try to do episodes when I can, where I, you know, take a movie and I talk about the agricultural accuracy of it, like The Martian or The Good Dinosaur, or you know, I, I did an episode on Minecraft, and now I do the Minecraft series, or you know, I do a Stardew Valley series, and you know, just try to make it relatable so that people understand, like, this is important, but I understand that it can be boring if you're not interested in this, you know. I, I like, dude. I like that. Actually, you know, you reminded me when you did the Minecraft, like you were talking about the Minecraft stuff, um, that. We have the Liberty Science Center over here by me. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. It's a very, very popular scientific center for usually kids and go on trips there all the time. Um, but honestly, do they do like nights for adults where they have like an, not an amphitheater, but they kind of have like one of those like, um, like one of those cosmic domes and you can like, and they do like rock concerts that are like, they so they did like a night with like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd while watching Ooh. constellations and stuff in the sky. Like it's That's so cool. Awesome. They had an entire series on Minecraft um, being used in education. Minecraft has like the education, the education version. System, yeah. And I was thinking, I actually once, um, I have projects actually still here for my first year teaching. I had the kids make their own manor system in feudal mm-hmm. Europe. And a kid said, can I make it on Minecraft? And he built the entire thing. I gave him two project grades of a 100. It was like, that's awesome. Insane. Yeah. I would love to uh, Minecraft. Like that's another way of using technology to educate on so many different things because yep. in history, like you can load the kids into like a map, a world of ancient, the ancient Mayan civilization. And it can have like the sundials and like all of, all of the different um, infrastructures that, that existed. And like, like you can really simulate like a lot of stuff. 
Yeah. Like for kids to experience by <laughs> using, yeah, using this technology. But like, it's cool because agriculture is like literally a part of like every single thing I you talk about in history. You can say, all right, while this was going on, the agriculture was. Yeah, it exactly. Was, it, it was important. It's always there, you know. <laughs> but it's never talked about. <laughs> right, exactly. Cool, it is the no, hidden history. It really is. And the thing is, it's usually the cause of a lot of things that go on in history, you know. So like, you yeah. know. Like besides the fact that everyone was farmers for a long time, there's also famine, plagues. Yeah, like the Irish, you know, the Irish potato famine, and the, yeah, you know, like the we, biggest, we already talked like... about all the yeah. But no, it's like which I don't know if you watch a lot of YouTube, but um, there's a YouTuber that I, I've started watching a lot more recently. Uh, his name's Daskalos, and he does a Minecraft series where he uh is rebuilding ancient Greek civilizations in Minecraft, and he's a professional archaeologist. Like he actually does, like you know, he, he explains how he does his job with archaeology. It's super cool, and I was already planning on doing my Minecraft series of talking about the agricultural revolutions, but then I came across his series and I was like, oh, well, and his series like blew up overnight. He went from like 100 subscribers to like 17,000 in like a weekend. And I was like, okay, so educational content can work as long as it's fun. So I'm, I'm going to do this, you know? And so, and I, I talk about him Gosh. all the time just because he's a really cool guy. And I, I, you know, he's really, I, I've talked to him a few times. He's pretty cool, but I, I love the idea of using, like you said, using technology to engage students, but also allowing them to see some of the things in education that they kind of miss out on. Yeah, you know, you kind of inspire, I'm not going to lie, you did inspire me. Um, I'm a non-TikTok haver. Mm. I'm contemplating, I'm going to probably, I, I, I'm like, I'm like, how can I reach these kids to like, give them bits of information that are like important, but in like a fun way. I'm thinking like, like, what if I just like made TikToks of me being like, just around the house, like, yo guys. Yo, we have a test coming up and we got to, we got to talk about Vietnam, bro. Like Vietnam, a lot of stuff happened. You know, I mean, I'm obviously being a clown about it right now, yeah. but like, just kind of like casually like going about my day, just talking about it and just like, kind of like giving like a summary of my lesson in like two, three minutes. Yeah. So the kids can like listen to it and watch it and it can repeat that information. So and I'm like, tr- dude, I hate TikTok so much. Trust me. <laughs> I do. Uh, my kids know I'll debate them on it. And there's nothing, I don't think there's anything good about American TikTok. But oh, but I mean, you can get recipes and you can, I don't care. <laughs> it's it's literally numbing the brains of all the children in the world. I don't want to hear it. I agree. But you know, I, but you're right. There are ways to use things such as video games and social media to actually support and scaffold learning, which I think is cool. I may have to bite the bullet. I'll make like a TikTok, like a history teacher TikTok account. That's what I was thinking of doing too. Like I got to like rebrand myself because I'm going to go for a PhD, I think next year. Um, And I want to like be, you know, kind of like increase my platform because like otherwise, like how else are people going to learn about technology and the, you know, the, the dangers and what we need to be aware of other than like getting people to listen to you, right? Like the reason why we have podcasts or the reason why we do outreach and share our information because What's the point of me keeping all this information to myself and then seeing kids literally suffer like eight, nine hours screen times, like not interacting with their friends, not having social lives, not not interacting with other students, not going to school events, not building a community, not being a part of their community. Like it's, yeah. you know, so we can use this stuff for like all good stuff. And I, I honestly, I'm going to like, I'm going to do a <laughs> lot of research because I, I told you about that. I have, to t- I have to teach that dual enrollment class Yeah. Um. all of a sudden. And <laughs> I'm going to do, I'm going to talk high agriculture uh agricultural like learning and like into the lessons because i'm thinking what i'm going to do is since it's a college level class i want them to do like a weekly some type of like um assignment hmm. kind of like a kind of like a uh what do they call them uh do it in like elementary school i for- bro it's been so long i forgot uh like a current event kind of thing oh yeah but i want it to be from the era we're talking about so like and what i'll do is i'll give them categories so you can they can do look at technology of the time um, they can look at the uh, science at the time. What was science like? Any new discoveries? I think I'm going to add agriculture actually to like that, that list. Yeah, because it, it adds for some extra diversity. If people are interested in like, you know, they want to just talk about like, oh my God, Mr. Durr, I didn't know in like the 60s, like um, that's when they invented like this or like Agent Orange, a a herbicide was used in yeah. Vietnam to kill people. Like <laughs> yeah. that's agricultural, right? Like, it, yeah. you know, and that's the stuff that was being sprayed on our food, you know, so it kind of like helps to kind of create like a, a better perspective for students and learning and like just it just goes to show you can tie like literally any any things together to have like meaning right and but yeah. also be meaningful not just like force it to have meaning it just naturally does which is 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I 100% agree. And I I also bit the TikTok bullet. I'm not a fan of TikTok. I, I spent a long time getting stuck on there and I've, I've been trying to avoid it. But I a couple of years ago started posting TikToks and I actually did have one blow up, which was pretty fun. Um, And this is the same stuff that I'm doing now. It was like a minute long video of me explaining the difference between a bull and a cow and a steer and a heifer. And it got like, I think it's up to like 1.5 million or something like that. But that's so <laughs> do you make money? Do you, have, do you make money on that or something or no? I try. The thing with TikTok though is you can't start making money until after a certain point. And then once you say, Hey, I want to make money, they're like, okay, and they cut all your views. So zero, like they, they reset the views? No, no, no. They don't reset the views. They make it so your stuff is deprioritized because that way if they if you get more views, they have to pay you more. And so they make it so your stuff is harder to find. Yeah. Yo, that's crazy. It I see, I didn't even know that. I didn't know that either when I started. Dude, these I, algorithms, I'm, I'm tired. I'm t- honestly, so, social media, I'm not a fan, bro. Like, no. Yeah. So I, I started, and you know what? That's why. That's why you yeah. don't see good shit. That's why these kids literally can't remember like who Stalin was, but they sure as shit can like do an entire three minute TikTok dance, right? Yes, exactly. So oh I I started doing more educational content on TikTok. And then so I, I got recommended to do the TikTok creator fund. And so I did it. And like right after I did it, I went from getting like a few thousand views a video to getting like a hundred maybe, which is you know decent. But it was like I just dropped by way more than I thought I would for that. And so I started doing research into it. And yeah, I found like tons of other creators saying, do not do the TikTok creator fund. It kills your views. Like if you care about your content, if you're in it to make money, then fine. But you don't, you do not do it until you are big enough to justify doing it. If you do it as a small channel, you are not going to go anywhere because they're going to slice your views in half at, at least. And if you are not like... Basically, if you don't have a recurring fan base coming back, then you're not going to be able to, to keep up and you're not, you're not gonna make a you're not gonna make a dime and you're gonna lose out on all that content. So that that's actually I, so sad. It's it so is. depressing, actually. Cause all the yeah. that's literally the foundation for all the educational TikToks or yeah. like accounts or and like even if education is fun, I'll be honest, like I, I'm a very harsh judge of like teachers and stuff because I work with some horrible ones. Yeah. But um you seem like a really engaging and fun teacher. You kind of like remind me of like how I teach, <laughs> which is cool because I know I'd want me to be a teacher for myself. <laughs> um, you know, so and it's like sad because it's like you genuinely want to bridge the gap between the lack of understanding of agriculture because agriculture is something we can apply to all our lives. Like literally look at me like some guy in the city. Like, you know, I I'm learning about this stuff. I'm doing my research and I apply it to my life and my thinking, my, like my worldview, it's important. And, yeah. but no, obviously little Jimmy John over here doing a little, you know, dab or whatever is, you know, making millions of dollars, you know, making thousands of dollars off a dumbass video. Whereas you're bringing up one of probably the most important issues in our lifetime and no one's listening. It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. And when people listen, it's great. You know, they have great interaction. They actually care a lot about what I'm talking about, which really surprised me. People were like, huh, this is really interesting. And I was like, cool. So this can work. Except TikTok mm-hmm. was like, no, it, it won't because you're trying to make money. So I'm not going to let you do that. And so as soon as I got rid of the TikTok creator fund, my views started to go back up, but I haven't posted in a while. So like my, con- you know, with content creation, consistency is key. And so I, I really need to get back into posting just to maintain that. But it's it's hard to do TikTok and the podcast and the Minecraft series in addition to teaching and you know doing my master's degree and doing all the other things that I have going on in life, taking care of steers and that kind of stuff. But yeah, so it's it is very I think TikTok can be a very, very useful and cool tool. But like you said, the algorithms are just stupid. So if you're gonna all do technology, it technology, bro. Yeah, all technology. It's not just TikTok, bro. It's even these dating apps, like the oh, algorithms yeah. that like literally and it's it's so sad and like unbelievable it's like I'm, I'm so i'm like a single guy mm-hmm. and like even using the apps it's like the algorithms built like against you where it's like you have to pay extra money to be visible on other people's feeds like you could be swipe i could be swiping for weeks and like these women are not even seeing my profile you know yeah. what i mean and it's yeah and it's crazy because our culture has shit and this is where i'm getting like into like the cultural history aspect of like what i do and like the big issue is now like there's a huge shift in social culture where it's like women don't want to be courted outside of technology. They yeah. want to be, they want to meet you on a dating app. They want to be DM'd on Instagram or social media. And that feeds into like this, this I've coined this term. I don't know if anyone's used it, but like this like social media ego that we've all constructed for ourselves. Like this is how I want to present myself. And it's sad because like the girls will tell you to message you there and then you follow them and then you message them and then they just ignore you and they get an extra, they get one extra follower. And now they're like, my life is fulfilled. Yeah. I don't know 
you know, so that's like some of the negatives I see with like technology and how it affects, you know, our culture. I know that's a little off topic of <laughs> the agriculture but, stuff, but the algorithms yeah. that go into all of this stuff, it does affect us in so many different ways. And it affects our learning and our education and like what we know and what we're able to access. And it's like, yeah, it's sad. No, and I and I'm going to go into my I'm going to put my my tinfoil hat on and be a conspiracist for a minute. But I have said basically since I started doing agricultural content. So I've been doing my podcast for five years now. And since I started it my senior year of high school, I have been convinced that agricultural content and not just mine, but all agricultural content is deprioritized in social media. The algorithms punish not maybe not punish, but do not reward agricultural content the same way they record other educational content. It's not popular. It's not. Dude, it's, a, it's a very easy. That's a that's a financial thing. Like you just know, um, do people want to look at like grass growing or do you want to see the sick dance, dude? You know, it's, yeah. it's very it is very sad. These are how the algorithms function, yeah. but it's it's all profitability. You know, we are now Um, I, I also will argue in when I do a dissertation, I want to argue like the human cyborg experience. I want to like talk mm. like I want to say like we are we are cybernetic already. Like we're not necessarily that biological like version of it but in theory like when you see kids walking in the hallway dude you for those of you that can't see um yep. but the kids have the, it's like that hand that phone hand grip yep right they're always walking with it connected to their hand like it's not it here airpods there's always some piece of technology physically attached to them somewhere and they're constantly connected apple watch like you're constantly in the loop you are you are a cyborg at that point right and then now with Neuralink and Tesla and, and, and Elon Musk and doing all that stuff, like the actual neural implants, right? Like, like this, like this idea of becoming a cyborg is actually a, a very near reality. So it's it's getting a little it's getting a little spooky. It's getting a little yeah. spooky out there. No, I agree. I agree completely. Um, oh, tinfoil hat, really quick. I do have a tinfoil oh, yeah. question for you about <laughs> about agriculture too. You're gonna love this. Cool, go for it. So reason so so I actually I follow like a very uh, very wide range of like um, social media things, whether they're liberal, conservative, mm -hmm. moderate, neither. Um, I follow conspiracy pages. I follow non -conspir I follow everything because I want to. What is like the narrative that everyone is saying? What are they yeah. saying about it? One thing I'm seeing a lot about is like Bill Gates. <laughs> everyone's speculation of his ownership of land, but yeah. more recently the. Um, his his new um his coding an edible coding, um it's called um appeal a p e e l. Have I've you heard, heard about this. that? I'm I sorry, have. I'm sh so I don't know if you've done enough research to provide me with some insight, but I haven't done enough research myself. But like I'm you know I I just did a quick Google search before just to double check and like polity fact. Wow, you know they're telling me if it's true or not. Um, they said it's false, but I'll be honest. I don't know. Bill Gates kind of rubs me the wrong way. Why does he yeah. own the most farmland out of any <laughs> other person in the world? Yeah, I I'm I'm looking at it right now. So I could not tell you. Um, to be perfectly honest, I uh my mom sends me this stuff all the time because she's a major conspiracy theorist in this area and every area, but that's beside the point. But she I love my mom, but she just sends me some crazy stuff sometimes. But yeah, I I am all I'm on board with the conspiracy theories around Bill Gates. I just don't know how much merit they have. And so I, I have a hard time saying, well, yeah, it's definitely this because I'd have no claims to back that up. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I've heard of the appeal technology and I, I don't know enough about like the science behind it to, to justify like what it is and what it does effectively. Yeah. So it, it coats fruits or vegetables with a plant-based compound that the company says slows water loss and oxidation. The primary cause of food right. spoilage, it's delivered to partners as a powdered mix with water before being applied to food. And it consists of pure monoglycerides and diglycerides, which the company said are edible compounds found in a variety of foods. They're extracted from the peels, seeds, and pulp of plants by Apple. Interesting. Yeah, I like I said, I, I've heard of this very briefly. I have not had the time to do a whole bunch of research into it. I would like to just to get an idea of like what this means. Why Bill Gates has so much farmland, I could not tell you. I have my theories, and many of them are probably conspiracy, but uh, <laughs> it, it's. Mm. But dude, conspiracy. I I feel, I've actually thought about. I've reflected a lot about this over the summer, and it's like honestly, I'm giving conspiracy theorists a little bit more respect because if you think about it, any theory is a theory. Like, really? what's the difference between quantum theory and a theory that the government actually killed that uh, JFK, right? Right. I mean, honestly, and there's probably 
There's probably more evidence that JFK was assassinated because, <laughs> first of all, the term conspiracy theory was created by the U.S. government because of the assassination. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, not to get like, I'm I'm just being a little silly, but no, um, I, I get where you're going, though. I, I, I In this article, though, really quick, I think you'd like to know, it mm-hmm. says um, far from being dangerous chemicals, um, monoglycerides and diglycerides are affirmed as, quote unquote, by the FDA, generally regarded as safe. Interesting. See, I don't see. Is that like not like re, is that like are you reassured? Oh, generally safe. Like, what do you like? What percentage would you put at, on like generally? Yeah, I have a hard time trusting that one. Which again, I'm I'm naturally a skeptical person, so I just like I hear that and I'm just like ah, I need to see more numbers before I trust that. But yeah. That's a yeah. I don't like generally. That's a that's a very weird word to use for that. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't just throw that. Yeah, it's just generally safe. You so know, crossing the street. Crossing the street is generally safe. Mm-hmm. I got hit by a car. <laughs> it, it was generally safe. Uh, so the interesting thing I'm I'm looking up right now. Apparently, um, Appeal Technology Inc. was uh, founded in 2015. So this has mm-hmm. been around for a while. This is not a new thing by any means. Um, th- here it says 2012 by James Roger, and he was oh, really? funded a hundred thousand dollar research grant from the Gates Foundation. Interesting, huh? So yeah. That is pretty old. I mean, it's more than 10 years, 11 years old. Interesting. See, I, I I go back and forth with this, right? Because I know people who are very anti-GMO and I'm very pro-GMO. And so it's like, I go with the argument of like, well, yeah, I trust the GMO science. And then they're like, well, why don't you trust this then? It's like- I don't trust the fair... scientists. Yeah. <laughs> the people producing it, right? That's I'm a, fair. I'm yeah, a, exactly. I, we have um we have a microbiologist, like he has a, his, his BA and MA are in microbiology and he teaches like all the AP and college classes and stuff. And I talk to him about this all the time. Cause like GMOs, like I told them, I'm like, dude, GMOs are kind of scary actually, bro. Like they could genetically modify things to be poisonous. Like, you know what I mean? If they really wanted yeah. to, um, you know, just cause something is GMO, what did they genetically modify and is right. it safe? Right. That's where it comes into question. Like just cause something says GMO doesn't mean it's bad, but it also doesn't mean it's good. Yeah, it's true. And sometimes it doesn't change anything about it. You know, sometimes the GMO is specifically for increasing yield. Or it's, it, exactly. Yeah. It's like the, safer from... Not- damage or um, insect right. infestations and mm-hmm. things like that. And that's the thing. And so I, you know, I, and I fully admit that like whenever people are like, well, I don't trust GMOs because like they could be just as bad as they can be good. It's like, that's perfectly fair. I fully am with you on that. My argument with GMOs is that we're not gonna be able to produce enough food to feed our growing population without them. That's my whole thing with it. If you want to question the science and the safety of it, there's an argument to be made there. I mean, I haven't found a study yet that says that they're not safe, but that same argument applies of, you know, well, if you trust GMOs, then why don't you trust this? It's like, it's not that I don't trust that. It's that I haven't seen enough evidence supporting that I can trust it to trust it yet. I've seen a lot of evidence supporting that I can trust GMOs and not very much supporting the opposite, you know? So it's, I, I've i I've done my homework and I've found that in most cases, GMOs, and I haven't, I've yet to find a case where GMOs have not been reliable, um, and so I trust them. The potential for them to be bad is definitely there, but the potential for a lot of things to be bad is definitely Yeah, same there. thing with yeah, technology, so, right? Like who has right. the power? Who's 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 actually controlling the algorithms and who's manipulating what people see on online and on, on right. this app? Exactly. So but like with you know, with this kind of stuff, it's very new technology and they're being very secretive about a lot of stuff about it. So it's like I'm not sure if I trust that. So, mm-hmm. you know, call me a conspiracy theorist if you want, but I'm very hesitant towards a lot of those types of technologies. Listen, man, it's fair. Skepticism is not a thing. Like if you think about it, like even anxiety, everyone like complains about anxiety, but when you have anxiety, it's that's your body telling you like, yo, you got to watch out for this. Right. right? Skepticism is the same thing. It's just like, hold on, bro. Like this does not seem safer. I need to like check into this a little bit more because it might be dangerous to my body or someone else's body that I care about. Right. Yeah. So it's, there's nothing wrong with being skeptical. If anything, listen, skepticism's the reason why we you know, have it probably invented and, and come to the realization of so many like innovations in our like lifetimes. Yeah. Cause people were skeptical about something, right? Like, yeah. I don't think it works this way. Let's, you know, like the heliocentric theory, right? Like people thought like everything revolved around the earth. And then someone was like, you know, I don't think the science points to that. Let's, yeah. What is it really though? Right. And then right. the guy gets crucified, you know, the guy gets excommunicated, <laughs> you know, it's like, right. <laughs> okay. But so, I mean, but was he wrong though? It's like that, you know, you can be a social outcast and still be right. Like that, those yeah. those two things are not. Is it worth it too? You know, is it worth to go right. down flames to be right? 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, honestly, bro, I'm gonna die anyway. Honestly, <laughs> if I if I could die, but like let people know like about all this information and be aware of like 1984 coming to fruition. Yeah. Um, and, and like all these all, all these like uh, old like like uh Huxley and like all these authors like literally rolling in their graves They're like, hey, bro, we warned you the government is like using all this technology to like make a super government and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah, actually I, kind of interesting. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I I'm a big Da Vinci fan. Like I, I've been studying Da Vinci since I was a little kid, and he, that's cool. same thing. And you know, it's like you always trust the outcasts because they're usually onto something. You know. Oh, did I cut out? Um, but yeah, do. no, I, I yeah, I, like Da Vinci. Like you know, Da Vinci was a weird dude. Nobody nobody trusted him. You know, they were all like, oh, he's just off making his weird machines. It's like, yeah, but those weird machines changed our lives. You know, like. Y- I trust weird people because weird people usually have something going on that nobody else is seeing. There's a reason they call them weird, and it's because they're usually seeing something that nobody else can. Exactly. Did, did Da Vinci actually create anything for agriculture by any chance? I have just curiosity. That's a great question. Um, he he definitely did. I, I want to say he created one of our earliest irrigation systems. I, you know, I was really into Da Vinci up until high school, and then I kind of dropped off of my Da Vinci research. I need to get back into it though. But I have like four or five books of Da Vinci on my on my shelf, and I haven't read them in years. I'd be willing to bet he did. But most of his inventions were for like military and war purposes. Um, just because he was I know with like all the flying kites and like right. <laughs> all this shit. Like, oh my god, this guy's a nut job. Yeah. But oh man, I actually I'm actually kind of curious about that now. It's not actually funny you brought it up. I'm gonna have to actually look into it too because I want to see. What yeah, the they're talking no, about. I I might have to um. Let me see. More agriculture. Yeah. Um, I can't really find anything about it to be quite honest. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think he did. Like, like I said, if he did, it might have been like irrigation technology, but he wasn't, despite living in a rural area, he wasn't very like agriculturally motivated. You know, it's like, like he, you know, he was the, he was the son of a priest, preacher, friar, whatever you want to call him. He, you know, he, he was a son, he was a, he was a bastard son and he was raised in the city and he was an artist and an inventor. And like, so nothing that he did really points to agriculture besides his love of wine. Um, but he didn't, you know, not because he didn't do anything in agriculture. Most of his stuff that was commissioned by the church or by the, the government of Italy to, you know, be used yeah. for war purposes. And so he kind of didn't really have a, you know, have a reason to create anything agricultural. Um, but if I find something, I'll let you know. Yeah, that yeah, that's fair. I'm because I'm, I'm looking through. It doesn't seem like he it is very unfortunate. Oh, but, he, wait, never mind. Oh, I read, I read that excitement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read he invented Ar- all the big <laughs> agricultural things. I read Archimedes Screw, and then I it just said Da Vinci did not c- concede the Archimedes Screw, <laughs> which Archimedes Screw was one of the first hydroelectric powered <gasps> machines. So, wait, hold on. I, I'm so upset. I can't read this. I'm so sad. But um, I found a JSTOR link. Oh. And it says Leonardo da Vinci, the first soil conservation geologist. I'm gonna have to. But find I, that I can't article. click on it because I'm not in, I'm not in school anymore. I could probably use it online because I'm still a graduate student, so I could probably get access to it. I'll send it to you. It's through. It's actually funny. It goes through Rutgers, I guess, because from uh through proxy i guess that's only because that's like my proxy that's where i would access jstor through it's like i went to Rutgers, so that's uh my last. Gotcha. damn i'm so sad wow okay i hate how things are you know and that's another thing too it's like oh you want to read this really interesting article someone wrote about something really interesting no you have to be a member or something like that and like wrong like you know and then it's like go go to tiktok for free stuff it's like but there is nothing on tiktok yeah but if you get in that would be really cool Let me see i was here. What yep, was I? I um, awesome. You got to read through that now. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, I, w- I was, wa- I'm watching actually this show on Netflix. Um, it, it randomly popped up one day. I, I don't like, I don't like the guy who hosts it. It's like this, like, I don't know. I forgot his name. Um, it was called Connected to Hidden Science of Everything. Oh. Uh, um, and it, he's kind of cool. He's like a weirdo, but, um, like, you know, like we said, weirdos do have, an interesting passion right yeah. his name is latif nasir and um he goes around in so many different things and talks about like um the first episode was on surveillance and talked about like he actually talked about how that ai was incorporated um in the farms to do that kind of stuff um they actually talk about um like excrement and like where it goes and like like the problems that it causes and things like that um and then he does one on dust and he actually goes with like a um 
a geologist from the Middle East um, Mm. because they're in Chad and they go to the Sahara Desert and they are, yeah, they're doing research on like fish fossils from lakes that used to exist there, you know? Um, Yeah, it's it's, it's actually, it's really cool. But he honestly, like he does a really good job. That's why I like when he said it's called connected because he kind of ties everything in together. I feel like he's talking about like agriculture, technology, um, like all this stuff like mixed into one, like, it's like that's this is a really good one I would suggest for like your listeners like people that are like really into um this kind of stuff yeah and then there's a few other food documentaries I saw I recently I saw I watched Poisoned I've heard of that the one dirty, the Dirty it. Truth about your food that's a good one hmm. um there's a, there's also a series called Rotten hmm. um and yeah and it talks about like uh the food supply chain in the United States and the like um the truths behind it and exposing like all of, like the hidden forces that kind of go into like creating all of our food there's like two seasons on it hmm. um house spiracy i also watched i've i have that one on my list i haven't watched it yet but i've been meaning to yeah so dude i thought like i told you i was i wasn't joking i was i've been like <laughs> you went, really you went in deep <laughs> i really have been well it's interesting because like once once i watched the one then i'm like wait no, I gotta, I gotta know more. Like, yeah. I, like what? How did I miss this stuff? How did I not know about this? You know, yeah. I felt dumb. <laughs> I was uninformed. No, the only agricultural documentary that I've watched in recent years was Food Inc., which I have a lot of issues with Food Inc., but that's yeah. for another time. Um, yeah, Cowspiracy has been on my list for a while. Um, there's another one I... It's technically not ag related, but the founder does cover a lot of like the impact of fast food on agriculture, which was pretty cool. Um, There's another one I watched. I don't remember what it was now. Um, But yeah, so I I used to watch a lot of documentaries on ag. I haven't in a while. I need to get back into them. Yeah, no, they were honestly some of the most like informative. And I, dude, I love documentaries. I'll watch them on anything. But I I've been like really hooked on this stuff lately. Hmm. It's just. Cause it's crazy. Cause it affects me so much, but I, I feel like I have no tangible part in its production in like yeah. anything that happens. I get you. So I feel like I'm at like the, the, the mercy of, of farmers, you know, and, and like the, um, the processing plants. Yeah. To a degree, just, you like, do whole... have a, you do have some, you do have a role in all of this. Yeah. I guess, I guess ultimately like as a consumer, you can like make better purchases and like make smart purchases and support certain farms and stuff that have better, healthier, moral, you know, efficient, sustainable practices. Yeah. I mean, I'll, give you, one. I'll give you two examples. And this is kind of the, you know, the premise of the ag literacy movement and my, my research, both my master's research and the purpose of this podcast. So I'll give you a local uh, domestic example and an international example. So domestically, uh, a few years ago in California, we passed a proposition, proposition 12. Um, and that proposition was uh, basically it's, it, required anybody who's producing um, pork, eggs, or veal to keep their animals in confinement areas of a of a specific size, you know? So like chickens, veal calves, and farrowing sows, which are pregnant pigs, have to be kept in, in specific uh, requirements of, of like holding facilities, um, which wasn't a problem for those in California because they were already following those, those requirements. The problem was you couldn't sell any of those products in California unless they were raised under those standards and while we produce a lot of eggs and veal in California, we we do not produce a lot of pork. So we were importing all of our pork, almost all of our pork from other states. So now we were requiring other states to follow our regulations, and they did not like that very much. And so we saw a massive, massive, like worse than COVID shortage of pork products and insane inflation of pork prices because we couldn't get them to sell to us because they didn't want to follow our regulations. And pork's already expensive. Yeah. It's like, it's, like for pork bacon, it's like, bro, it's like eight or nine dollars a package here in like yeah. New Jersey. I and buy turkey bacon. It's cheaper and it's, it's better and <laughs> yeah. healthier anyway, but still. True. But yeah, no, bacon is still, I don't know what bacon is. It's like 10 or 12 bucks right now. It's ridiculous. Jesus and. Christ. I yeah and then and it it got so bad that other states actually brought it up to the supreme court and said hey they can't do that like states are not allowed to regulate each other that was like you know we we very clearly established that (laughs) you know and the supreme court was like nah they can do that that's fine and so the states are now petitioning to get the president to revoke the proposition because they're like we get most of our business from selling to California and we refuse to follow their regulations because we're not part of their state. And so it's like this whole legal battle right now. And that proposition was passed 
because people cared about animal welfare. It was voted on by the by the con- California consumers. So it's, saying- ho- it's hard to say. It's hard. It's hard to yeah. say. Like, what do you do in a situation like that where like there's a shortage of, of this particular food, mm-hmm. right? That people want to eat um, and are willing to pay for. And then now, like you know, you are now because you're making a welfare for the animal decision. You're now hurting financially the pig farmers in like the you know the west on the west coast the Midwest. Mm-hmm. It's like hard. It's like what do you, it's like well we want to care about the animals and we want to do business but like just adopt the practice. It's like or just don't force it on us. It's you know it's like yeah it's a really hard. It is you know what's the direction of that actually? Like, is it just still like 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 the administration Biden administration hasn't like heard anything about it yet or they like, have they gotten responses? I have yet to hear any updates on it. The Supreme Court gave their ruling on it a couple months ago, and last I heard, they were still trying to get confirmation from the federal level to get it revoked, but it hasn't been cleared yet. So. Yeah, but it's one of those things like, you know, it's that's an ag literacy issue that people, you know, and I'm not saying people are wrong for voting on it, but if people knew what it could have impacted and like not going to say that they had the, the hindsight of it being this big, but just knowing that, OK, if I if I vote on this, that's going to impact my pork prices and my bacon prices and, you know, the supply of all those things, having that awareness might have changed some of their voting decisions. So the consumers directly impacted that. It was the legislators that caused it because they worded the document that, you know, the way they needed it to to get it passed. But the consumer are the ones who ultimately voted on it and so it was their their influence that impacted the entire agricultural industry so that's that's where i usually go with you know in terms of like your vote and your purchasing decisions do impact the farmers because that that shows them where the demand is and so they're going to shift their practices to that and if you vote on a regulation that impacts them it's going to really you know more than likely potentially hurt your ability to get that product um so you know it's 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 worth it to be aware of it, not just for the sake of supporting farmers, but for the sake of making sure that you have food on on the shelf that you're able to pay for, you know. Yeah, that is true, actually. And- yeah. So, and then my international example. Um, I talked to a Swedish farmer uh, back in 2016. Uh, we have a, an event here in my hometown called the World Ag Expo, and it's the uh, world's largest ag- agricultural exposition. There are people from uh all over the world i mean like we like it's it is huge like we call it farmer disneyland because there's just so awesome. much to see it's so cool they, and they, they showcase some of the newest agricultural technology coming out that year and so we get to we get to preview like all the new drones and the new robots and the new precision tech and it's it's beautiful love it anyways uh i've met farmers there from germany from sweden from italy from you know like all over the world just because they come to see our technology and our operations and they come to learn from our farmers and vice versa I talked to a Swedish farmer there back when I was like 16, and he was telling me that they were facing a huge issue in Sweden with uh, public opposition to GMOs. The government did not outlaw GMOs. Like that's the important detail here. It was not illegal to grow genetically modified crops. What the government did, though, was say, hey, enough people are mad about this and enough people don't trust us and don't like this that we're going to put a soft ban on them. We're going to de-incentivize you from from growing with with these types of products. You still can, but you're not going to make hardly any money if you do. And so the farmers had to basically either sell out or stop using GMOs, which basically was the same thing because they couldn't they couldn't keep up their yields that way. And what it resulted in was Sweden becoming almost entirely re- reliant, reliant on imports for their food because they couldn't grow enough for their own population. That's crazy. And that, you know, that, that actually reminds me exactly of um, what Reagan did with um, seatbelt safety laws. Oh, <laughs> I know yeah. it sounds stupid. <laughs> and, well, um, uh, and the drinking age. So the reason why mm. the drinking age in the U.S. became 21 um, was because Oh, uh, there were there were like I forget, they called them like uh bloody borders where like in one state it would be 21 to drink but the other one it would be 18. So all the high school kids would like drive over to the other state, get the alcohol, get drunk, and then they would drive back under the influence. And there were so many I think car accidents like once they and basically what the um once the federal government kind of got wind of this and people were like tired of this shit they're like they're like that's it they're like ban alcohol they're like no we're not doing that again prohibition didn't work yeah but what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually like not give states funding if they're dry if they're um their uh driving laws or their alcohol laws are not 21 or older mm. so they basically kind of like soft bullied every single state like we're gonna cut a percentage of your federal funding unless you do this yes so every state had to do it yeah no exactly you know, like you know, when money's involved like you're like all right government i guess you're strong arming me into doing this i guess yep 
So um, and, and yours is probably worse. I think. I think <laughs> ours was like a good change. I think that yeah, one was that, that was the less than one. ideal. But you know, and, and my my point always is with that is like you can make arguments for both sides and you can make an argument that that was a good decision or a bad decision. But the fact of the matter is it was the public perception that influenced that decision. And so it was the public's awareness or lack of awareness of that concept that ultimately influenced the farmer's ability to provide food for their people. And so if you want to say it's a bad thing, then you can say it's a bad thing. You say like, okay, well, the consumers didn't know enough about GMOs to make an educated decision about that. And so that influenced, but it wasn't even a vote. It was just, we don't like this. And the government said, okay, you don't like social pressure. Exactly. And yeah, I don't like that. Cause it's like, who are you? Like, who are these people? You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I'm sorry. If If someone comes up to me, I bet. I mean, I people are like, yeah, you shouldn't teach this in class. You should. I'm like, tell me what I can and can't teach. <laughs> right. Go, go screw yourself. Like, yeah. You know, if anything, they should be. They should be able to have like all everything like undisclosed to them. You know, I'm I'm big on that yeah. with the kids. I like I don't like. I want them to be exposed to like all the issues and stuff. Um, yeah. that's why it's like like you said, transparency is like super super important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I that's the problem is like, it's like the government like can't even like be transparent sometimes because people are just so dumb and uneducated. Like. If you tell them something, they're going to flip a shit, you know, yeah. that's kind of like one of the biggest problems. And then now you have your government, t- you have up your a bunch of social pressure from your society saying, we don't like GMOs. We don't even know what they are, but we don't like them. And then yep. you're like, well, all right, farmers, they don't like it. Don't do it. Sorry. Even though it's better for yep. them, probably arguably better. For arguably, them. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, and, and it's one of those things. It's like generally I... better. <laughs> generally. <laughs> yeah. Generally considered better. Um, But no, it's, and it's my, my goal with this podcast, with my ag literacy research and with this entire initiative is I don't expect like, and I get this all the time, you know, like people ask me like, well, what do you think when people don't support agriculture? That's fine. You know, like if you don't want to support agriculture, I'm not going to force you to, but I ask that you're educated enough about it to not support it. Like there are reasons to not support agriculture and that's okay. Like I, my goal here is not to promote all the great things that agriculture does. I do that because I think it's important for people to understand all the good things agriculture does because we don't talk about ourselves enough, but or when we do talk about ourselves is to defend ourselves against all the bad things being thrown at us instead of saying, Hey, look at all this great stuff we're doing too. You know, we just say, we're not doing that, but my goal is not to be here as an advocate for agriculture. It is, but my primary goal is to make sure that people are at least aware of what's going on. And so that way they can make that educated decision for themselves. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm completely transparent with my stance on things. I support agriculture, despite the fact that I acknowledge that there are people who do not do what they're supposed to in agriculture, but I'm not going to be upset if you do not support agriculture, as long as you're educated about why you don't support agriculture. If you can say, you know what, I haven't seen enough research to support GMOs being safe, then I'll say that's fine. You know, I I completely agree with you there. I think there could be more research out there. I trust the research that is out there, but I can see where you're coming from with that. But you've done the research. And so I trust that you have a solid opinion about it. You know, if you say, well, I, you know, I, I was told that GMOs aren't safe. And so I don't trust them. It's like, I I have a harder time taking what you're saying seriously then. I agree 100, 150%. And that's like, that is the issue that we're facing in like every field of study, every, everything, not even, not just agriculture, not just technology, not, it's just, it's just that there's like a wide, um, a pandemic in like ignorance, you know, like people are not willing to do the extra work or invest the extra time to like, listen to something like this and like learn something. Right. Yeah. They'd rather, you know, like I said, I said it multiple times. They'd rather literally do anything else. Yeah. Which is crazy, but it it, it is. But how do you like, yeah. But how do you like, how do you like inspire someone to be like interested or passionate about like, knowing what's going on right i yeah. feel like i feel like honestly i feel like it just comes down to personal experience and it sucks because like i'm teaching like i teach a lot of juniors and seniors so i get kids that like this is like the most critical time like they got to make like adult decisions for themselves and they need to figure out what the hell they're gonna be doing with their life yeah and sometimes it's a little scary because i'm like I, these kids are like not ready to be adults and like i'm like yeah, i hope they end up making good decisions for themselves because i feel like they're not equipped or informed enough or like care to inform themselves enough on like how to do this stuff. And, you know, a lot of people complain like, Oh, well, you know, high school doesn't teach you how to do taxes or this. It's like, well, maybe they should look into it. You know, maybe yeah. they should take the initiative to like, cause like, dude, I like student loans come back <laughs> yeah. next month, September yeah. 1st, baby. I, I fixed my fast. I fixed my, uh, my student loan package for public school teachers. All right. Um, you know, but, um, you know, I, when I was a freshman in, in college, dude, half of my debt is for my first year of college. Jeez. I didn't know better. I dormed. Yeah, I dormed. It was like yeah. 12, 15, it was like $15,000 just to dorm. Oh. I had to take out loans and stuff. 
Yikes. It's like literally half of my debt is just yeah. from dorming one year. I'm like, shit. Yeah. You know, I have a master's degree too. Like 30 grand for like two degrees is not bad. Yeah. But damn, from one year, like I didn't know that. All I know is at the end of the year, I had in the beginning of the year, I had to go to the place with my mom, you know, do and they get to like sign all the paperwork and fast blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And on the last day, they hand you the bill and like, yo, pay up. And I'm like, bro, I'm poor. I can't, right. I can't, I can't, I can't pay this. Yeah. Yeah, a farmer. <laughs> As um, if. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, it's 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 tough. I I, I would love to. I want to show. I'm gonna. I'm that. Like I said, I honestly, what I learned from this at least is um a lot of different perspectives that you've kind of showed me, or like at least the the importance of agriculture, like even in our everyday life. And I kind of want the kids to know that because like you know our our like we're a very liberal state, so like they push like oh, you need to talk about this minority culture or this yeah. and that, or that I'm like, I'm like, bro, where's like, like, honestly, they should be incorporating like agricultural literacy, like as right. a part of our inner curriculum, like absolutely. Like, like all, all that stuff. I I think curriculum is stupid. It's like, it's like weird. It's, I don't know. I think it's just bullshit paperwork for teachers to do. But like when I teach, I teach very holistically. I talk about everyone, everything of all genders, identity. Like yeah. I don't care about that shit, bro. If someone was important, I'll talk about them. If someone did something important, um, or there was an important movement or something going on in the social strata at the time, we'll talk about it. Like it's important, exactly. you know? And I think I, like I said, I told you I'm being dead ass. I'm going to add agriculture to like the, the weekly assignment I'm going to give them so that they, if hopefully some kids actually like maybe one week, you know, they, they want to do technology and they're like, bro, I did technology three weeks in a row. Let me just like screw around and do like agriculture and see what's up. Yeah. So if I can get yeah. like one or two or three, yeah, honestly, like I think providing the kids with options, but also like emphasizing the importance. And I'll try also like in my lessons, I'm going to try to be a little bit more agriculturally minded in yeah. talking about like, um, cause like, obviously when you talk about like, for example, the civil war and you talk about how the North like orchestrated, like kind of like isolating the South in a way where um, they cut off like all major trade past the Mississippi. And like, right. that's where all the food was being grown and mm. all this kind of stuff. So I might like, what I'll do is since, Oh no, I don't, I don't do the civil war. I have to do reconstruction, but, um, I don't do us one. Unfortunately, that would be a us one thing, but I would definitely look into it to talk about like, like how did that actually affect the war and look at it at a, instead of like giving it like a couple sentences, actually, like, let's look into it. Like, why is this important? Like have a discussion on it. Like, what do you, what would you have done if you were the South and you were being, um, you know, all of your supplies, your food was being cut off or like, think back. I always tell the kids, like, think back to like the era of like sieging towns like yeah they literally starved people to death for for months right yeah they would burn their fields and they would you know like that that's a very not i'm not gonna say common but it was it was a very it was like, a common strategy during the middle of the era yes. during for combat and like making towns answer to your you know your military aggression i get it <laughs> right yeah no like, like they, they held their food hostage essentially they were like hey if you want to keep yeah. eating then you'll surrender like you know or you'll die like that's it, it, that, that's just how like that's the role that agriculture plays in society and that's people have known that for a very long time and we're kind of getting to a point where people don't know that anymore and so that's kind of exactly you know, that's where we need to in my opinion that's where we need to shift our focus is to you know back to the important things which are like hey the basics probably know yes exactly you should probably know where your food comes from first of all because when it gets taken away from you you need to know where to look for it exactly yeah like dude how are you gonna survive if like all of a sudden there's a food shortage like honestly like what are you gonna do Right. Like, yeah. I'm like, are you going to kill your animal and eat your dog? Like, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know. Like it, it will drive people, you know, people have to survive. We ultimately, we are creatures too. Like, right. right we're animals. Uh, yeah. We have instinctive natures and we, you know, ultimately would revert hopefully to like some type of primal like response mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But like, like I've never been hunting, bro. Like I've never been hunting. I've never killed an animal. I've never like, um, harvested an animal like for for food and cooked it myself i've never done any of that either myself you know i'm i'm a, I'm a gun owner um but you know i'm like a pro to a person but i've never gone hunting and i think it's more or less like i don't want to kill like an animal and then like not eat it i feel bad yeah um but i think like building that skill right these are basic skills that people are not like having or develop or like the knowledge of like for example like we teach kids to be scared of guns it's like Bro, like, how do you think, like, you know, we went hunting and shit. Like, how do you think you provide right. food and, like, you got to kill an animal and, like, you know, not, yeah. not each other, but, you know, right. still, like, right? So, like, there's a lot of knowledge to be had that we're not kind of teaching this modern population of people, like, in farm farming, agriculture, but also, like, understanding their food supply. They just, kids just take everything for granted today because they have everything at their fingertips. Like, 
when I justify kids and like, actually what we're going to do is we're going to talk about socialism, communism, like big, I have actually, I'm an owner of the communist manifesto. I like to bring it in and like show the kids and be like, this was a bad book. And they're like, who cares? You're bald. Who cares? You know? So <laughs> um, I show them the book and stuff. And honestly, to be quite honest with you, I honestly, this is a really good point. I'm going to actually tie in a lot of agriculture into the communist system. When I talk about Russia, communism and talk about, um oh shit what is the oh what is the word that's gonna kill me it's a it's a k word the russians call their farmers oh um, yes 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 i know what you're talking about i can't remember what it is either but um i'm gonna look at it i'm so sad uh, uh oh what uh, is it it starts with the i'm pretty sure it starts with a k i think you're right um the uh kulak or no is it not, it might be something I, yeah it is a cool I guess, kulak, I was thinking, yeah i'm like i'm like bro it sounds like too close to gulag i'm like yes yeah, i'm like yeah. am i thinking gulag and with a k i hope no, not but i was thinking kulak. i was thinking kulak yeah exactly right mm -hmm. and like dude the farmers in russia like bro people like you know stalin killed 15 million people yeah the nazis only <laughs> killed six yeah. like yeah what <laughs> like you know people they do these are things that are overlooked and a lot of it was like the russians controlling the food supply like they, they literally systematically starved people in ukraine like in like modern like mod modern day ukraine today because it was obviously under russian control um but modern day ukraine like they literally systematically starved towns of people like food is the most powerful thing like it really yeah. is like the most powerful thing around it's the most powerful thing that ever <laughs> You know, no food, no life. Yeah. Right. Same thing with water. Yeah. That's actually a um like a farmer motto around here. No food, no life. Really? Oh, yeah. bro, I'm a farmer. Bro, where's my <laughs> where's my where's my straw hat? It was meant to be. I stereotypically uh, yeah, Tom Deere. Call me Tom, Tom Deere. Deere. <laughs> yeah, John Deere, Tom it. Deere, I'm like his son or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I know we have been going for quite a while now. I know it's pretty late over on your end. Uh, did you have any other topics we did not get to that you wanted to address? Um, no, honestly, I liked everything we talked about. I had obviously I had like a ton of notes from like um from watching all these documentaries. I'm like, yo, this guy's gonna love this stuff. <laughs> um, on it, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I think like if anything that I can take away from it personally is like I told you, like I'm definitely gonna be incorporating more agricultural thought into like incorporating like history lessons and like talking about how does agriculture actually affect the history at this time like um because yeah. I, I did that with like the with the government subsidies in like the 20s and 30s like during world war ii well prior to world war ii starting um officially and um you know because i think it's it's a learning moment not only for me but for them also and maybe that will spark some curiosity to have them like do some research or just understand a little bit like, kind of spreading the message of agricultural literacy all the yeah. way over to new jersey there you right? go. Yeah, that's perfect. I <laughs> and love some that. things, some things that I find crazy. Um, I don't know if these are like could like when I saw these stats, I was like, nah, this can't be real. <laughs> but like it to produce one hamburger, it requires six hundred and sixty gallons of water. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> that's two months of showering. <laughs> what? Yeah, I believe that. Like, I, dude, I don't. I'm very amazed. Like, there's so much stuff. Honestly, there's so many questions I have. Um, but I don't. I'm not gonna waste any more time. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just keep doing research, and I'm gonna keep listening in and like trying to figure out this kind of stuff. But like, I, these statistics are just like absolutely like mind blowing to me. Like, it's just so surprising. Like, thirty. So animal agricultural. Uh, ag animal agriculture uses thirty percent of all our water consumption in the world. And all of the, and 65%, of, and it's also responsible for 65% of the world's nitrous oxide, which is 296 times stronger than CO2. Yes. Nitrous oxide is the hardest one to take care of. Yeah. Right. And it uses 40% of all earthen land. 40% is for farm animals. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right. It's also the, it's also the reason why there's like ocean dead zones. Mm. And it's also the reason for 91% of all of the Amazon rainforest's destruction. I believe that. I actually know the company who does that. It's, it's, bro. And everyone's like, oh, the rainforest is like being destroyed. And it's, but we are obliterating nature. Like we're literally shitting all over the earth. And it's, yeah. it's so sad because it's, it's like, 
honestly, bro, I'm, listen, I'm not signed up for a long time. I'm signed up to be here as long as whatever exists has me here for. I'm cool mm -hmm. with it. But if if we go out, dude, to some like bullshit, like the ocean <laughs> like explodes or something, I'm gonna be really pissed off with people because it's like, honestly, bro, respect. This earth is so beautiful. Life is beautiful. You gotta like have a respect for it. Like, even if you don't have a respect for yourself, but like have some respect for like the literal one thing that like you are made from. Yeah. I don't know. Like we are of this earth. Like at least like actually one thing you'd actually like to see. Um. People, there, um, there's companies in California, I think, that do human composting, or in Washington, like right above yes. you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, or in the Seattle. Damn it, I remember it being somewhere over there. I can't yeah. remember the name of the company, but they actually have a permit, um, by the state to do human composting, and they take your yeah. body and they turn you into compost over 30 days, and then they plant you with a tree. I have heard of this. This is a very controversial thing right now, but I have heard of this. It, it's an it's an interesting thought. I'm not against the idea. I just don't think I would do it myself personally. But mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I can definitely see the, there being benefit in that. Yeah. I'm a little bit too superstitious to go near land where people have been buried, but that's a separate issue. But it's, no, I think that the idea of it is cool. And like the being able to use it as a solution to some of the issues that we've been talking about was definitely an interesting approach to it. And so I, I definitely see potential there. Um, I think that we have enough to justify a second episode. So you might have to come back on for another episode to talk about some of the other things we didn't dude, get to. I, dude, I'd be so but, down. <laughs> okay, sweet. Um, just I'll do they, more research. I'll have like even more research done. Now, cool. now I have a couple other ones that are on my list to watch that I didn't get to go get through yet, but we could definitely uh, coordinate uh, part two because I, I like, honestly, I like long format. Yeah. It's, I was even thinking about it now. I'm like, I'm like, bro, we've been going on for so much longer than I want. Like when I even originally like thought, yeah. because I, I've been like really tired lately. Just, I'm trying to like get back on my sleep schedule. I'm like working out a lot and stuff. So I'm just tired, but I'm like, bro, my brain is so stimulated right now. Like I, <laughs> like, I, I can't, I can't now. Like this is, the, this is some good shit. This is That's some, great. I'm glad stuff. to hear it. No, uh, to, you, honestly though, to like, to your credit, like I think, um, so it's very similar to like what I've done. Like, cause like, when I was in grad school, I was actually gonna be a World War II technology historian. Um, but I'm like, bro, everyone does that. That's corny. Um, so I'm a big gamer. My mm. I didn't tell you about this, uh, but like my master's thesis was about the intersection of like um technology, culture, and gender, and talking about how like early forms and understandings of technology, who's capable of using technology, shaped and manufactured um essentially women being excluded from video game culture because technology wasn't seen as a, a women's field. It was like a, a man's field there's tons of like there's i have a bunch of evidence obviously to like support this and basically my argument is just saying that because men were at the forefront of technology and technology was seen as a masculine tool women that were excluded from this field and you know at the time i think in like the 70s women were graduating from colleges with like 38 37 percent graduation rates in computer science degrees wow which was pretty extensive today yeah. 2017 i think is the last stat i have um, it's down to like almost 14%. Oh, 15%. wow. Huh. Yeah. So my question, that kind of started all my research questions. Like, well, why are women leaving this field? Right. Then I, I do an analysis of like Atari and like all the sexualization they've done. They've had hot tubs, um, meetings, board meetings, like naked with like women in bikinis being their secretaries, delivering them files and food. Um, wow. yeah. Oh yeah. So much sexualization. Like if you were a top producer at Atari, um, he would hire you like your own personal secretary. Um, a bunch of crate, yeah, dude. There's like a whole history behind Atari alone. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, dude. It's yeah. So that's like that's like my niche, but like I think your niche is like so applicable. I think it's so important because no one, like I said, no one's talking about this. Um, the people who are talking about this are not nearly as informed as you are. Um, and the avenue and the approach that you're taking is very palpable, which is really ad admirable because I do the same thing like with my thesis and with my dissertation. My goal is not to write to academics. I don't give a shit what academics think because they'll be able to read whatever I write. Yeah. Um, but I care about the everyday person who wants to read and understand like, you know, why do we treat people differently because of our perspective on things, right? Yeah. So I think that's, I think what you do here is like just super important. I just wanted to make sure that like your listeners absolutely know that. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I always, I always, uh, it, it makes me feel good when other people, you know, acknowledge the importance of this message. And so I, you know, I, I don't, I don't like taking the credit for, you know, for being the one that is doing this, but there are very few ag literacy podcasts out there doing what I'm doing. And so I'm trying to be, you know, the one that's 
like doing my best to get conversations flowing. And I actually, as far as I know, I'm the only ag- ag- agricultural podcast that talks to people outside of agriculture. Most of them are pretty internal. Um, and so I, but that I, doesn't solve any problems, you know, right. You're preaching right, the choir. It's an echo chamber, you know? So yeah, exactly. And I don't, I don't like that stuff. That's why even with my podcast where I, I literally call on experts from like all different fields, I don't want to talk to other historians. I don't want to talk to like, I want to talk to people that are like out there, like in the field, doing the work, doing the research, a part of this issue or this social mm-hmm. dilemma or whatever it may be and talk about it from experience as opposed to just another historian. Cause like, bro, like I wrote my master's thesis about how women responded to cultural change and technology right i'm not a woman um so i don't know how women feel i can't yeah. even begin to tell you so one research thing i had to have always keep in mind and my my advisor was actually a woman she's a technological historian hmm. and um i had to keep in mind the perspective that like i'm not speaking on behalf of women i'm amplifying the voices of women from historical narratives right so yeah it's like everyone's job is like different um, in the way that we approach it and the way that we have to kind of like bring it to people's attention. Right. Yeah. And it's nice that you are kind of like, you're in this and you're involved with other people too, but you got to spread, you got to spread the word. You got to branch out to all the people that don't know this stuff. Cause like you said, you're preaching to the choir, like, bro, they already know ag culture. Right. Like, yeah. They don't, you know, it's not like you're like changing their mind. Right. It's right. Like, yeah. Like, all right, cool. Yeah. I'm just saying, Hey, people need to know more about ag. And they're like, yeah, I agree. It's like okay, then we we're not getting anywhere, you know. I yeah, so tell what are you gonna do about it? Know. You're right. I don't yeah, know, I'm gonna keep farming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm gonna tell other people the people need to know about ag. It's like that doesn't help anybody, you know. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, so I I I've made an effort to do that. So no, I I definitely appreciate that. But no, I think that I think that we there is more left on the table that we'll have to come back to because like I said, I know that it is what eleven o'clock over where you're at. Eleven eleven. Make a wish. Yeah. I wish more people would learn about agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree with that one, but uh, yeah. So I'll I'll let you go because I know that you have you know the sleep schedule to get a hold of, and you know as a teacher, I I definitely understand how difficult that can be. Um, I've got yeah, a it's gonna take to... some time, bro. Yeah, I've got a lesson to prepare for tomorrow morning, so I need to do that. But uh, no, we'll touch base again and you know cover the rest of this stuff. I know there's definitely a lot more. We like we might even have to have a part three depending on how long the next one goes. Bro, but... I'm down. <laughs> I'm always I'm always good for it, dude. Don't as Sweet. long as you te- as long as you tell me. Because I'm like because I know this is your whole expertise, so you're gonna have to tell me, give me some like if you give me some pointers and stuff, I'll kind of, kind of like keep that in mind while I'm going through like documentaries and research, and like I'll try to like incorporate information that would more suit those specific conversations as opposed to like this is just kind of like just the general knowledge i've built up and then just yeah learning from kind of like what you offer to share you know yeah no for sure and then, like, that's the kind of conversation that i like i like it to be more free form like as much as this is an agricultural podcast i like when people dip into their other areas of expertise because it allows me to show them how related all those things are and i, I like that kind of stuff so uh, I- <laughs> cool well if you need any help in integrating agriculture into your lessons let me know and i can help you with that um honestly don't go too far because I'll 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 be, I'll be right there. I really will. I and I, I'm not saying this just to make you feel I'm gonna actually be doing, incorporating this stuff. I think it's it because like you know what's the what's the harm in including it, right? Like yeah, even exactly. if they don't like if they don't like it, I doubt that they wouldn't like it because there's a lot of controversy behind agriculture culture and right. um to the way it's been implemented and ran by like the government and how it's affected wars, like you said, and like mm-hmm. all these different types of things. I'm sure that they'll find some interest in it. So that'll be yeah. some That'll be cool. Definitely. All right. Well, before we close up, do you have any final comments? Let people know anything else about you, anything anywhere they can find you if you want to be found or if not, then you can just disappear. That's up <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, If you guys are interested in my podcast, I haven't worked on it in a very long time, Um, but I may, I don't know. I'm still contemplating like my identity as a person. Like what, what do I, what kind of content do I want to make? I was thinking of doing like talks with Tom as like a weekly kind of thing instead where I'm like, kind of just briefly talking about like what's going on in the world right now, like based on like all the things that I've consumed media wise, like what's going on in the news and politics, right and wrong, you know, debates on rights, blah, 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 whatever it may be. And just kind of addressing it and like being like, Hey, this is like my opinion, or maybe I ran into this particular issue. I don't know if you guys are running into this, but this was my experience. Is anyone else experiencing this cultural like phenomena or this issue lately? Right. So, but for podcast terms, uh, my podcast is called get informed with an exclamation point at the end, uh, podcast and has, has a pretty good amount of episodes. And I talk to a lot of different experts or just, just general people talking about culture, society, um, their perspective on things. Contro- I talk about a lot of controversial issues. 
just to kind of paint the image of both sides just so that you get a, like a general understanding of like what the hell's going on with this like right yeah. um so that is on instagram and it's also on like i guess like spotify podcast because spotify is like they just took over anchor actually recently they did yeah um i didn't know that that's how long i haven't produced an episode for a while oh, wow. <laughs> um but, but you can find it there wherever i guess wherever podcasts can be listened to um and uh yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I was thinking of calling it like history because my last name's Dur D E R R, so it would be history. I like it. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of corny, but <laughs> I don't know. I got to figure it out. But get informed, or you can catch me here for episode two and three, or whatever, however many good episodes we make. Oh yeah, for sure. We'll definitely have at least another one, if not two, maybe more. Beautiful. We'll see. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Tom, for joining me. I appreciate it. It's It's been fun. I uh, hope that everyone listening enjoyed and learned a thing or two from either one, if not both of us. Um, but uh, yeah, I will make sure to put all your links down in the description so people can find you if you want to send me all of those and I can do that. If you send me your email, I can send you the DaVinci article because I have it downloaded. So you can. Okay, perfect. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's all I have for this week. Uh, you know, don't forget to check out Tom and all that kind of stuff. And I hope to catch you all in the next episode. And don't forget, if you ate today, thank a farmer. Wow. We have finally wrapped up the longest episode to date of Talk Ag to Me. Thank you so much, Thomas, for such a great episode. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, that was a, a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed uh, recording all of that and talking about all of those different uh, his, historical significances of agriculture. It's a topic we've been talking about quite a bit on the podcast lately, but it's uh, it's one that I think is important for people to realize. So if you didn't catch one of the episodes, hopefully you caught this one. Uh, and if you hadn't listened to the last uh, episode yet, then you should definitely do that now. Um, but that's all I have for you guys this week. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Once again, if you'd like to support Thomas, go down in the link in the description and check him out. If you'd like to support me in this podcast, you can check out all of our links down in the description. Make sure you like, follow, comment, subscribe, share, do all the things with your online and offline families, as well as if you're interested, going down to the Patreon and donating a little bit to the podcast. That'll help keep me running, help keep things going a little bit, make it easier for me to get episodes out more frequently. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys and all your support. I can't wait to show you guys the next episodes we have coming down the pipeline, but I will see all of you in a couple weeks. And don't forget, if you ate today, thank a farmer.